All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. This is a re recording of my uh, webinar. Uh, and so we had some technical difficulties with the webinar software. You guys weren't able to see my screen, it was bugging out. And uh, the webinar company had some outages. Uh, I was chatting with them just before this, but don't be, uh, don't be uh, faint of heart because we have this recording now. So I'm recording this and um, I'm going to deliver all the exact same content. The only thing that takes away from it is um, now you guys won't be able to ask questions. Um, and so what we're going to do about that is uh, I have a Facebook group that I've created uh, that we have a number of publishers in. Um, and so this way uh, you guys can ask questions about the webinar in there. And then uh, other members of the group can maybe weigh in as well. And I think it, it's just nice to have kind of like multiple opinions and things like that. So um, nevertheless, I am going to get started right now. So hopefully you guys can see everything and uh, we're going to go ahead and kick off. So this is the one step SEO tips and tricks webinar brought to you by Zoic. For a lot of you guys, I'm sure you guys know me, but if not, um, my name is Tyler Bishop. I'm an award-winning marketer. I'm the head of marketing for Zoic. I'm a successful startup founder. Uh, I've served as an SEO expert for competition boards. I've helped hundreds and hundreds of websites exponentially, incre in exponentially increase their organic traffic. Uh, and uh, I'm the co-host of the Publisher Lab, which is a uh, popular podcast for digital publishers. So that being said, uh, I'm in the process of moving right now. So I'm moving I'm moving across town and I've got uh, a home filled with boxes and all this stuff that I need to move. And it's it's a really daunting task because it seems like a lot of things to do. Uh, and I've got to move everything from one place to the next. And I'm always trying to figure out like really easy ways that I can maybe just kind of uh, kind of hack this process. So this picture really summarizes kind of what I, I want to do when I move, which is basically just load everything on top of my vehicle and then just drive it across town and just kind of toss it into the new place. I'm just trying to find easy ways to accomplish a lot uh, together at one time. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to go through a lot of material uh, and I'm going to go through it relatively fast. Um, but the, the, the purpose of that is, is that it's being recorded. And my hope is that there's something for everybody on this webinar today, whether you're an expert in SEO or um, you're just trying to get the hang of uh, how you gather more organic traffic to your website. And, um, and my hope is that by recording this, you guys can go back and hone in on the different uh, areas that really pertain to you. Uh, but there are things in here today that I think could benefit everyone. And uh, hopefully you're one of the people that everything that we're going to talk about today is going to benefit you. So that being said, the question I always ask myself when I start doing these types of things is how can I deliver advice that is impactful and easy to do for everyone, uh, black belts and white belts, people that are experts, people that are uh, novices, uh, people that are just starting out, people with different types of infrastructure, WordPress people, people with um, uh, PH, custom PHP websites, uh, different types of publishers, reference websites versus, you know, viral social media uh, types of sites, uh, sites concerned about messing things up. You know, people uh, sometimes, you know, when you have organic traffic that's doing well, you you really don't want to rock the boat. And so uh, I really thought hard about what types of advice I could give to pretty much everyone uh, that I included in that bulleted list. So one of the things we can do here is we can check on often neglected best practices and uh, and look into data and figure out how do we do things like make pages faster? What are simple, easy ways to increase the speed of, uh, of your pages? So this is something obviously Google is becoming more concerned about. I think you know everybody probably hears about it a lot, um, but it's, it's great for your mobile experience for your users as well, which is something we should all be thinking about. So we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about taking advantage of Google's newest rich features. So uh, rich snippets and things along those lines, what types are out there and how do you get them? Um, and then we're going to talk about increasing the relevance in the eyes of uh, Google a little bit more. This is something we talked about in the last SEO webinar. Uh, hopefully you guys had a chance to watch that one. If not, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, so I would encourage you guys to go back and watch uh, that where we talk about improving relevance uh, for Google. But we're going to talk more about that today and dig a little bit deeper. Uh, so without any further ado, let's kind of hop right in. So the fat, one of the best ways and easiest ways you can speed up your website is uh, focusing on your images. Images notoriously are too big. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. One is um, confusion and misinformation that's out there. 
So um, we're gonna use Google's page speed tools here in a minute. Uh, optimizing my images is literally the only thing I use this tool for. It's such a terrible tool for actually identifying what might be slowing down a page. Um, but we're gonna talk about finding better ways here in a minute, but um, we're gonna use Google PageSpeed tools, but I always like to just preface that I don't like that tool. It's not a very good one for being able to take actionable uh, steps towards making your site faster. So that being said, images are too big. Um, we wanna make them smaller, um, smaller in two different ways. The actual physical size of the image from a pixel standpoint, and then also from a file size standpoint. So two really easy caveats right here of whether or not this is important to you. If you have manually ensured all your images on your site's pages have been resized and compressed, you can skip this part. Meaning you personally or whoever put those pages on personally change the size of those images and then also saved the file with compression. If you didn't resize your images or compress them man manually when you inserted them into the your uh, inserted them into your post, you need to pay attention. And there's a big reason for that. WordPress plugins are not good enough. So almost all publishers that I talk to when I start talking about images, they, they check out because they think, well, I use a WordPress plugin that does some type of image optimization or I use it to upload my images and that it, it compresses them. It does not. It does not do a very good job of that at all. There's not a single one on the market that does a good job of compressing images. If you have an image that's a thousand kilobytes bit, uh, thousand kilobytes uh, in size, it's ten times too big, and your WordPress uh, plugin is going to compress that by maybe let's let's be generous and say thirty percent. Okay, it compresses by 30 percent. It becomes 700 kilobytes and 700 kilobytes is still seven times too big so you can see just why these these tools are completely ineffective but have no fear we're going to kind of get into how we do this uh, and fix it right now so three rules everybody likes really easy rules to follow so here's some good kind of rules of thumb one keep your image size under 100 kilobytes and you can actually get most images below 50 but 100 is a really nice threshold for you to kind of focus on um, and then there's no need for an image to really be wider than a thousand pixels, uh, sans several exceptions. Um, you can resize and scale, uh, with a thousand pixels being kind of the top end size, uh, for width that the image needs to be. Most mobile screens aren't going to allow anything above 650 pixels anyways. Uh, so you really need to be thinking about those, those visitors with your images anyway. So, um, thousand pixels. And then one of the best ways to kind of start this process that we're going to go through today of resizing your images and making them smaller, uh, start with your top landing pages. Start with the pages that are getting the most traffic. Start with the pages that um, you're trying to increase the organic traffic on, the stuff that's, you know, on those page two, page three of Google. Um, improve the speed and the file size of those pages. So I'm going to bounce off here and I'm going to start kind of giving you guys some real world examples. So uh, this is a site I found called the Country Cottage chic the country chic cottage um this is not an azoic user so i went out and found this one and i threw it into google page speed tools here so for you guys um, most of you guys are probably fairly familiar with it if not you can type in page speed tools it'll be the first thing that pops up i throw the url in here i ignore all of this crap and i go down here to optimize images so when I go in here, I recognize immediately there's a lot of images in here. This is telling me that this page has images that um, that need to be optimized. You know, I've got one here that's, you know, 304 kilobytes too big. Um, I don't know what Google is using for their threshold, but it, th this is telling me that this is an issue. If you run your uh, a, a page of your site through this and you're not getting this, this warning, there's a good chance that your images are, are optimized well enough. It doesn't mean... They maybe couldn't be manually shrank a little bit more, but when you start seeing the majority of your images on a page uh, being flagged by this tool, there's a good chance you need to go in and manually um, uh, compress them. So we go back to this page. Uh, I find a, uh, a image here. This one looks fairly large. My guess is it's pretty big. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this image. So I save it. When I pull it up, I can see that this image is 
201 kilobytes. So twice as big as what I said the largest it should be is. So you can see right here, 201. So we want to make it smaller. So if you have Photoshop, so I'm going to show you two ways, one way with Photoshop, one way without. If you have Photoshop, we can pull this image up right here, and I can go into my image size. The width is already 700, so it's already the width that I want. But let's say I am only worried about mobile. I'm going to make the width 750, so I'm going to resize it. Okay, so remember, we want to resize it below 1,000 pixels, and then I'm going to go to export. And then I'm going to go for save for web. And this is going to compress it. So I can choose here the quality. In most cases for the web, you're not going to notice a big difference between medium, high, and very high. And so I go JPEG and I go medium. And you can see here this is going to compress it down to 76 uh, kilobytes here. So reducing it quite a bit. And I'm going to save it and replace that old file. Now, if I don't have Photoshop, there's something else you can do. You can use this imgonline.com.ua. Uh, I like this tool. There's a bunch of them out there. If you search image resize tool, there's a bunch of free ones. But remember, you just upload your file. You know, you want to set the width at 1,000 or below. Uh, keep your aspect ratio so that it scales the image properly. Uh, don't worry about any of their compression or isolation stuff and just save it. Then once you've saved it, this is one of the easiest things you can do. Even if you don't resize your images, this tool is really great for compression. So this is Optimizilla. Uh, I, send, I must send these guys tons and tons of traffic because I just think they're a great image compression tool. All you have to do now is go in, take my file that I've uploaded here, open it and it's going to automatically compress this file for me so you can see it brought it down 23 percent it still didn't shrink it below here you can see the compressed version below that 100 uh 100k uh compressed image uh threshold that i wanted to set but i can actually go over here and i can take the quality down a little bit and you can see it's previewing it for me and there's almost no difference between these two images and you can see this one's got me down to about 73K now. So that's good. I'm going to apply that. And then you can see it's reduced by 64%. Now I can just re-download that image and um, I'm in good shape. So now I've got my compressed image now. Uh, it's resized. It is literally less than half the size that it was before. And um, now I can go in and replace my former image. If you're a WordPress user, one of the things that I really like to use here is replace image. It's a really simple plugin, but it makes the act of replacing uh, a large image with a smaller one on your site really simple because all you're going to do is overwrite the image. So all of your alt image tags in that material stays intact. And that's important from the standpoint of if I go in here to my media, as opposed to uploading a whole new um, a whole new image and then replacing it inside of my post and writing a new alt image tag, it's the same as if you have a PHP database or a file database. Basically, all I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out the image files in this case because I don't want to have to go back and rewrite my alt image tags and all that kind of stuff. So if I want to replace it, I just find my image inside of my media and then the replace image plugin will allow me to simply go in and then upload a new picture here and then replace my old one, which is really simple. And then again, if you're you know, a file-based site, you can just go in and, and simply replace the file as it is. So that's all really easy. And let's see. Before we finish up here, one other thing that I wanted to mention was if you were trying to find other opportunities or good, uh, I guess, low hanging fruit to be able to kind of what pages should you really be taking a look at and doing your doing your images with is one thing you might want to take a look at. So this is my site injury health blog that we looked at last uh, last webinar. I went into Big, Zoic's big data analytics and I went over here to site speed down here and I scrolled down to slowest pages. And Timed Interactive is really one of the best stats for understanding um, how fast your content is loading for your users. 
because it's time to interactive is how quickly the actual content and media on your site loads, not uh, all the unnecessary scripts and the asynchronous, uh, asynchronous stuff that's kind of lazy loading down the page. Um, and so you can see here, I've got some pages here that are fairly slow. This page, for example, I know for a fact uh, has tons and tons of images on it. And some of them were taken from a cell phone. And so I'm sure that some of them are too large. So that's probably a huge culprit as to why that's, that page is particularly slow. And so um, using this tool, you can kind of go in and figure out maybe some other targets for, um, you know, you might want to take a look at all the pages. You can see here's my average time to interactive for this site. And I may just want to start going through and looking at some of my pages that uh, are over that threshold there. So that's a really good tool you can use. Bouncing back into our presentation here, let's summarize some of what we just talked about as it relates to kind of making sites faster through images. Uh, follow the rules, 100 kilobytes or, or smaller, 1,000 pixels or uh, is a maximum width, and then uh, focus on your top landing pages to get started. Um, and if actually, let's bounce back here for a second. If you are want to know what your top landing pages are, you can go over here to content and then go to landing pages inside of um, Big Data Analytics, which I'm gonna have to sign back into here, it looks like. But while, while it logs me back in there, one of the things to keep in mind is um, if you go into content and then landing pages uh, there in Azoic, you can sort your uh, landing pages by page views and you can very easily see which um, which site, which pages are your top landing pages. Um, and then we want to resize and compress using Photoshop. And if you don't have Photoshop, you can use Optimizilla. You can actually use both um, if you really want to get those images super small. Um, but Photoshop's a really nice, easy tool. Uh, same thing with Optimizilla and any free re resizing tools that are out there. Uh, and then consider using replace image uh, plugins if you are a WordPress user, um, so you don't have to swap out your old image tags. Um, basically, you just want to overwrite your old image files as opposed to replace them. So that's images. So we mentioned that we were also going to start talking about uh, take advantage of its results. So this is actually like we're doing a bit of a, a pretty hard shift here. So we we're talking about page speed and images and things like that. Um, but actually, before we go all the way down there, I, I do want to go back and show you guys um, the landing page um, material because I know that that is something that comes up from time to time. So if I go into sites content and I go to landing pages, you can see here, I can sort by page views. And sorting by page views is gonna tell me what pages are getting the most right here. And if, we're, if you're really trying to figure out too about your site speed, um, I know I kind of, um, I kind of prefaced uh, just how um, I was kind of negative towards Google's page speed school, tools. Google does actually have some really good tools, um, but let's do this. But the unfortunate part of that is um, they're not really that great in the page speed tools, but they are really good from a um, from if you use uh, Lighthouse or their developer tools. And so if you go to any page that you think uh, might be slow for whatever reason and you go to inspect, you're going to get this screen here. And so after I click on inspect, if I click on network here, what I can see here is what's called the waterfall over here, uh, right there. And so waterfall is telling me what is what is loading first and how long it's taking to load. So I can get a good idea of what types of things might actually be slowing down my site. So you can see here, these are, these are some of the images that are in here. I can see the length of time that it takes them to load. Um, and then when they're loading in proportion to everything else on the page, this is a really great way of kind of identifying what the culprit really is when a page is loading slow. Um, one of the things that I'd actually identified, and let's see if I can find it again here um, as I kind of review this site. Some of the stuff that seemed to be taking a long time to load last time when I was on this page was, you guys will notice, oops, 
on this site that they have some social media widgets right here uh, at the top of the page. And it looked before like number one, those images uh, were actually taking quite a bit of time to load and they were taking a long time to call out to. So these this social media widgets actually making a call out to Pinterest, to Facebook, uh, to Twitter um, to uh, have that tool integrate with this page. And uh, that was actually taking a decent amount of time. And I found that in here uh, last time and I can't seem to find it again this time. But it's a good way of being able to identify um, what might be particularly slowing down uh, a site. So I recommend the waterfall as being a, a tool to use when you're trying to figure out what in particular is causing a page to load slowly. So you can see exactly how long it takes everything on a page to load and um, and you can identify the guilty parties that way. Okay. I think that's what we wanted to do. Talked about the landing pages. Okay. So back to rich results. Sorry to bounce around a little bit. I just want to try to give you guys as much powerful information as possible. So if we want to take advantage of rich results, what are rich results? Well, it's stuff like this where you can actually see um, this is a good example uh, of a search that I did yesterday. So SEO techniques. So this is kind of the modern Google. It's interesting because it's way different than it used to be. And it actually changes a lot. And we don't always notice this. But look, I typed in SEO techniques. So I get a snippet here, right? So it's taking this piece of content from this site and it's putting it in what I call position zero. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here eventually. But look, now the image that they're actually taking here is from another site. So Google image is pulling in a image from backlinko.com and the actual rich result is coming from tutorialspoint.com. Interesting, right? And before they even give me any more, um, any more information, Google's actually creating this kind of like rich snippet wagon here um, where you're getting all these other questions that include rich snippets before they actually even take you to the organic results. So this is position one and standing between position one and the actual search box is a rich snippet that includes an image from one place and a and text from another and then you know anywhere from five to ten sometimes and they keep expanding um, other rich snippets so as you can see in the modern google getting um, getting these rich results and being optimized for them is really important so we're going to talk about that today so Page one used to be positions um, like one through 10. And um, now it's more like, I would say one to eight. If you look at the studies, it looks like organic results uh, average between seven and 8.5 per page. And a big part, part of that is because of, well, ads and ads have always been there, but because of these rich results. So kind of hammers home the point that we were just talking about. You see things like, you know, uh, if someone's researching laptops, you know, you can you can add uh, structured data to your site that allows your site um, to have this type of material pulled in from Google. So what, what's happened here is these are products that have been reviewed or, uh, you know, these sites have information about a product and they write uh, structured data on their page that um, allows them to identify the image and other information about this product that Google then pulls into the search engine rankings page. And it doesn't just happen through markup. We're going to talk a little bit about how it happens in markup first. So how do I do this? How do I add this stuff to my site, Tyler? I want to add this stuff to my site because obviously you sold me. I want to do this stuff. Cool. If you're a WordPress user, okay, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to kind of address WordPress users because I know there's a lot of you guys, and then I'm going to address um, everyone else. So one of the, the plugins that I really like for this, and I don't endorse any particular one, there's several, and it's not to say that this one's an end-all, be-all. So if this one at some point breaks your site, just let me know. I just want to let you know now that I'm not personally recommending this one. It just happens to be one that I'm using. So all-in-one schema, rich snippets. 
And what that looks like in practice is whenever I open up my uh, my particular page or post inside of my inside of WordPress, uh, I have this area here that says configure rich snippet. It opens into a drop down. I can say that something is an item. I can enter the reviewer's name, uh, enter the item to be reviewed, give it a rating. Um, you know, you obviously guys, you guys will see star ratings and things along those lines inside of uh, search results. Um, this is how those things uh, tend to show up there. Uh, I can, you know, we were talking about those product listings before. Again, you see it gives me an option to put an image in here. That's where those images here are coming from. It's from whenever, you know, you add, you know, this type of content to your, um, to your site. So rich snippets do not show up on your page. Um, it's, it's code that, uh, allows crawlers to basically scan your site and figure out um, a little bit more about the information on that page and for you to kind of mark up the site with additional information, things along those lines. So if you have anything that falls into kind of these different categories here, you know, articles, for example, do any of you guys write articles? I'm sure you do. Um, or reviews or anything about a product or a service or a recipe, all this kind of stuff um, has rich snippets. So WordPress plugins are a really great way to add this stuff to your site in a simple way. Um, but if you don't use WordPress, it's okay. Um, you can go into Google has a tool called Google Structured Data Markup uh, Helper. So if you just search Structured Data Markup Helper, this tool will show up. It takes you to a page that looks like this. Uh, I wrote an article recently. And uh, so I'm going to select that this snippet is going to be for an article. I put my URL in here and I click start tagging. Google's gonna crawl that page real quick. It's gonna load this up and so, boom, there's my page, all right. So now what I do is I go in and it wants to know this information over here. So I highlight my name, I am the author, I highlight the date, this is the date that it was published, and it wants an image. There's the image. So you can see I can go through this entire process here where I'm, I basically scan through my article, highlight uh, different aspects of it, the author, the date published, all this stuff that Google can then pull into the search results page. And then I just write create, um, create uh, code here. Um, and basically all I have to do now is take this script and put it in the head of that page. Simple, Re really, really simple. So that's how you can add structured data to your page. But in our modern era, Google is taking stuff from sites without structured data. So if you're if you're sitting here and you're saying, I have a thousand and one things I'm going to play, I'm going to work on optimizing my images. I don't have time to get to this just yet. Um, does that mean Google is not going to take is going to permanently kind of ban me from these rich snippets? I'm not going to get the benefits from them. Not the case. So here's a good example of, you know, somebody, uh, somebody Googled, why do they call New York the Big Apple? You can see here's a rich result here uh, from Wikipedia. And this is not from any rich data markup on this, this site's page. They've actually just kind of stolen this content from Wikipedia's uh, description here. And it doesn't just happen at the top of the page. Google is just kind of taking stuff from wherever. So... It's just an example of um, this position zero being kind of crowdsourced through Google. It's obviously using rich data as kind of a is is a really good way of uh, of uh, answering questions and providing searchers with relevant information, whether it's images or information or specific types of rich uh, listings or something along those lines. But they will just go in and grab content to answer these types of questions as well off of your site. So. You can see here, you know, this is why I really call it position zero is because if you can get a rich result, not only do you get position zero here, which is really the top, top result, but if you already ranked number three or number four prior to that, you're still going to get that ranking too. So you're kind of double dipping here. So it's two opportunities for traffic on, on page one. And this includes these kind of like drop down, um, these drop downs here. So 
if you can get these rich results, they're going to also appear in these types of things as well. So it's really a big opportunity around a lot of your different keywords. And so how do you go out and how do you get that? Um, yeah, and yeah, again, they dominate mobile results as well. You can see it takes up the whole screen. So um, as opposed to getting multiple results like we, you, you know, things have in the past, um, now rich results are taking up the whole page. So one of the things that I recommend is creating snippety content sections. So this is something that's been really successful for this injury health site. And actually a lot of sites that I that I work with. So I have a couple different sites that I that I personally work on. And um, in in all of these, I've really taken this strategy to heart and it's worked really great for getting rich snippets. So I'm going to bounce over here and we're going to take a look at the, my, uh, one of my pages. So this is one that I wrote about a recovery time for knee bursitis and treatment options. So I start trying to create sections of my content that start to ask the types of questions that um, that searchers might ask. So what is the recovery time for knee bursitis? Can you see that maybe showing up in one of those, you know, kind of drop downy um, uh, uh, rich snippet menus that shows up under positions zero? I, I bet you can. Um, look, there's images here that are that are marked up that are relating to the the particular subject. You know, lots of questions get asked, and then the sections are very small. You know, what are knee bursitis symptoms? Typical knee bursitis symptoms are, and I try to make the content unique as well. So, you know, there's I'm sure that there are multiple places out on the web right now where you could search knee bursitis symptoms, and they're going to give you stuff. So. I don't want to write the exact same things that they have. I want to try to create something that's unique. But you can see here lots of questions and lots of answers. So think about whenever you're trying to add snippety sections of your content around a subject, think about it as question and answer because that's really one of the ways that Google is starting to do this. And I ask a lot of questions in H2 and H3 headings or in bold text. And underneath of that, I try to answer the question um, in, in as much of a kind of snappy way as possible. Uh, so you can see here, I can imagine them using this question and then these bulleted lists or, um, you know, this question and then this image. I could just, I, I try to imagine what types of Q&A might be able to show up in rich results. So I really try to structure my content that way. So that's what I mean by making it a little bit more snippety. So with all this, um, kind of in mind, there's probably a lot of people on here that are, are from the old school of SEO where we started talking, you know, before Google started taking content out of pages and making them position zero or asking us to add rich data to our sites. We had meta descriptions. Uh, how many of you guys remember meta descriptions? I'm sure many of you are raising your hands right now. So the question has always been kind of an old school question is, how long should a meta description be? And um, this used to be about 150 to 180 uh, characters. And even there's still some really great SEO tools out there like Yoast that still, you know, have, recommend that 150 to 180 length. But here recently, you can see the average length of Google descriptions has almost doubled in size. Actually, it has doubled in size, 325, 350, in some cases, 380. Um, characters. So that's a lot more real estate. So if you're not, you haven't been taking advantage of that, you would think, you know, those longer descriptions, if Google uses the full meta description, there's kind of an advantage there, right? Well, let's get into that a little bit. You can see here, it's, it's kind of dynamic. So Google doesn't just take your meta description now, whenever it lists these things in search results. So you can see these ones here, they're all a little bit different. Um, and it's not because that webmaster is, uh, in particular has you know, written one that, that, that is that link. Google is sometimes taking content from the page itself and dynamically inserting it along with a meta description, or in some cases, ignoring the meta description completely and just entering in their own, um, you know, their own collection of content from your pages. So should you go out and rewrite all of your meta descriptions to be 350, 380 characters long? Probably not, but realize that it, there is an opportunity um, that you can uh, write meta descriptions that are uh, 380 characters long when you write new content um, and that Google might use that. So you have more real estate now. So I guess my point is, is that if you are, meta descriptions are far less important 
than they used to be because Google is not using them always by default or any specific link, but you do have more room than ever before. So if you think you can write something that's relevant to your page or content, um, don't feel like you're limited by 150 characters. Um, so what do we know about Google now? What are the takeaways from this kind of rich data section? Um, think about the modern search engine. Uh, think about how the rankings page looks. You know, um, this is a good example. I search what is Photoshop, and uh, you know, over on the right hand side, I get I'm getting information from like five different si publisher sites. One of which is Wikipedia. Um, I'm also getting recommended all these different uh, searches. Uh, I'm getting knowledge graph at the top. I'm getting a video here. Um, all this stuff is incorporated as a part of rich results and rich content that's, that Google is displaying. So really think about your content in terms of how do you um, mark up your content so that Google wants to take more of it and put it in that position zero or include it in search results um, whenever they have kind of rich stuff that they're pulling in. And then how do you make your content more snippety? How do you augment existing content when you write new stuff? How do you, how do you think ahead about what types of snippets uh, you might be able to get with those types of things? I've, I've heard it, re this modern era referred to as the snippet gold rush before. So and then again, you know, when it comes back to kind of the old school meta description, keep in mind that they're not as important as they used to be from the standpoint of, um, you know, the one that you write might not be what Google takes, but you do have more real estate than ever before. So me personally, when I write meta descriptions, I write them 300 plus words long now. I don't go back and augment and change all my old ones, but I, when I write new content, I take advantage of the fact that Google might use the full the full meta description. So I, I write a longer one now typically. So the very last thing that we were going to talk about, we we're going to talk about making searchers happy, uh, which is really what Google talks about quite a bit, which is relevance. And so when we talk about relevance, one of the things that we know is a factor is actual page engagement. So for those of you that haven't heard me talk about this before and need a quick refresher, um, engagement is not time on site. Uh, though it's it's a little bit different. So engagement is when someone is actually reading the content, not scrolling quickly, messing with navigation, waiting for things to load. Um, it's when they're actually engaged in the content. And uh, we kind of set a threshold for what is engagement at about 15 seconds of engagement time. So when someone is, you know, not scrolling through, waiting for stuff to load, you know, et cetera, there's kind of a clock that starts. And once it reaches 15 15 seconds, we say that person is engaged. And um, then, you know, we look at total engagement time. You know, when we're look, talking about engaged page views per visit, it's how many engaged page views had 15 seconds or more of engaged time, that sort of thing. So let's really dig into this a little bit more. So one of the things that I think is really fascinating when we get into this is I like to go into behavior and then new versus returning. So I'm in big data analytics now, Zoic's big data analytics, which is a really great tool for really understanding uh, visitor behavior. So I can see here, I definitely have uh, more new visitors as, as opposed to return visitors. But what I'm really interested in is my average engage time for both of these visitors. So here's what's cool. My new visitors spend two minutes and seven seconds average engage time on my site. My return visitors, 57. So my return visitors are spending almost 100% less uh, engaged time on my page. Their engaged page views per visit are far less. Um, my bounce rate is way higher. And um, my, engage, you know, my engaged page views per visit, my engaged time. This is really fascinating because when I think about my site, it gives me a pretty good idea of um, what types of visitors are coming and enjoying my content to the most. So it gives me this ability now to ask a question. For my website, is this what my intention is? Is my website built for people that are coming to it for the first time to get information? Because those are the people that are enjoying my content the most. If I thought that my website was built for return visitors, the loyal people that are coming back, you know, I can go and look at my return visitor frequency here under behavior, I'll just go to return visitor frequency. And I can start to understand, you know, my new users visit versus those that visit all the time and those that visit not very often. And I can see when I sort by engage time, 
per visit. My new visitors are, I mean, I've got one here, right, that visited um, seven days since. So this, this guy's kind of an outlier. I can ignore him for now. I don't get a ton of traffic on this site, so I don't have as much big data as some of the rest of you. But new visitors here, I can see they're, they're my number one. And then after that, it's the people that aren't really visiting as frequently, you can see. And so what that tells me is that my site is really geared for new visitors, which is great. If that's the fact, if, if that truly is the case, I would say that my site is, it's a bit of a reference site around injuries. And, uh, in most cases I'm writing snip, snippety information, um, that's gauged towards people in Google search that are trying to find out about an injury. It's not really a brand. I'm not really attracting people back for second or third visits. And if they are coming back for a second or third visit, they may just be coming back to get, you know, kind of refresh information that they maybe have gotten the first time. So this information makes sense to me, but if you're a publisher, that is, um, you know, writing content and trying to build a loyal user base. This is really useful information because you may learn that the people that are visiting your site the first time are the ones that are the most engaged. And you may be saying to yourself, oh man, I'm creating more uh, beginner content. I'm not really creating content for my loyal visitors because they're not as engaged. They're not visiting many pages. So you can use this information um, to essentially figure out more about your audience, who's actually on your site and either tailor your new content um, to, to, to kind of fit the things that you want to try to achieve. If you know this, um, maybe you say, hey, I don't care if it's new visitors, if it's return visitors. Um, I just want to increase my engagement time. Well, knowing that your new visitors are the ones that are most engaged, create content designed for those new visitors um, as opposed to ones that may be coming back for refreshers on information or something along those lines. Another thing that can be really beneficial uh, here inside of behavior is visit depth. So if I go into visit depth here, what this is going to tell me is going to tell me how many page views deep does my average uh, visitor get? Or not average, but how, you know, it's going to basically break down visit depth for me. So I can see here, you know, do they go, you know, first page, second page, third page, how deep are they getting? Well, let's look at my engagement time. And sort by that. So again, it's these, it's my, you know, new visitors that are only hitting one page seem to be the ones that are uh, engaging the most. Uh, in fact, more than twice as much. So most of my website visitors are new visitors that are just hitting one page. They're actually the ones that are the most engaged. But wouldn't it be nice to know if my most engaged visitors were visiting five pages per visit or two or one or three, this would give me a really good idea around the behavior of my best, most engaged visitors. So I might really want to think about how I write content. You know, if I find out that my best, most engaged visitors visit three or four pages at a time, I might want to start trying to gather ways that I can um, uh, get people to, to, to visit subsequent pages. So whether that's related articles at the end or just more links inside of your existing content to other pages, um, just find ways to keep people kind of getting deeper and deeper into the site. If you learn that the people that get deeper and deeper are more engaged. So one last one that I think is pretty interesting that you guys can use to, um, to improve, uh, engagement on your site is I'm going to go down to user experience here and I'm gonna go to scroll percentage. So this is going to tell me how far people are scrolling down the page. So here's, what's really cool about them. Uh, this, uh, about my site here is if I sort by average page engagement time, you can see, obviously the most engaged people are the ones that are reading all the way to the bottom, right? This is good. Um, I obviously want this, but I can see here that when people get scroll beyond 50%, so 25 to 50%, they're spending a minute 25 of engagement time on my site. When they go over that 50% threshold, that time doubles. So for me, I look at that as like a hard line in the middle of my content is if I can get them to scroll past that 50% mark, I'm going to get almost double the engagement time from them. That is awesome. Think about how Google is going to see that if I can get more users scrolling beyond 50% and get them spending way more time engaged on my site, don't you think Google's going to find that to be more relevant for their searchers? I think so. So Think about this when you're 
when you're creating content, think about all the different things that you can do or augmenting your existing content for that matter. All the things that you can do, whether it's breaking up paragraphs and sentences around that 50% mark, or maybe for you it's 25% or, 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 or 90% or 10%, whatever it is, break up your paragraphs more, use more bulleted lists, use some images, um, try to find our infographics, try to use things that are going to keep people scrolling down the page, break up the content. Um, sometimes this means making some, some sentences or headers or, uh, or strong tags and things along those lines to really break up sections so that people want to keep going down the page to kind of extract information from it. Sometimes people get stalled by big blocks of text, uh, or, or images that aren't really relevant that kind of catch their eye. And then they realize it doesn't really relate to the content. So just try to think about where that threshold is for your site and then what you can do on those pages at that mark to try to keep people going. Because for me, this is this is pretty impactful. This is double. I can double my page engagement time if I can get them over that 50% mark. So that's really good uh, information to have. So that is it as it relates to um, um, all the material that I have. So. Basically, what do you do now? How do you take this information? What do you do with it? Um, number one, make your images smaller. It's an easy one. If you think for even one second that maybe you have images that are too big, hey, that's a low hanging fruit to make your site faster, make your file size lower uh, on your site in general. It's a good best practice. Um, it's an easy thing to do. Uh, add rich data markup to your site. If you're a WordPress website, it's easy. You can do it through plugins. It's a simple thing to do. I encourage you to do it. If you don't have a WordPress website, Google has that great tool that allows you to kind of just drag and drop, do it super fast, and then you just add the code to your header and you're good to go. Um, and then you can also make your content real snippety. So I gave you guys an example of one of my sites uh, where I had done this, but just I want you to think about the rich results in Google and just how do you take advantage of that? How do you answer the types of questions that searchers have? Because um, really when you think about the modern search engine rankings page, uh, the number one result doesn't come till halfway down the page sometimes now. Uh, and then we looked at big data analytics and talked a little bit about different ways you can hack your engagement times and um, really the, the sites that we're seeing that are able to do this really start shooting to the top of search results. So I encourage you to start using some of that data to do these things. And um, so I mentioned this before, but we have a Facebook group called Content Creators and Digital Publishers Sandbox. Um, there is the URL if you want to type it in. Um, otherwise, you can just search it on Facebook. But um, unfortunately, because we couldn't record this live because of issues with uh, Go uh, Webinar Ninja, um, we weren't. Uh, you guys can't ask me questions live, which I hate. I love answering questions. Um, but I will do it inside of this group, or you can email me at tbishop at azoic.com if there's something a little bit more specific. But if you post inside of the group, everybody that's a group member can kind of chime in and you may get some really good advice from fellow publishers as well. So join that group, ask me questions and let me know how this stuff is working out for you guys. I'm hoping that uh, this was helpful and um, yeah, I will see you next time as we continue to do these types of webinars. Thank you very much and I hope you've enjoyed it.